Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N R. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we will solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 75. Turn to it. Please turn to it. Make sure the book is in front of you. Page 75, the very first problem that we see there is number 85. If after having watched this video you find this helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me at Kashwani Prep, that's P-R-E-P, -E Kashwani Prep, at iCloud.com. Send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Let's look at the very first one. It says x squared minus 2 is less than 0. Question simply is, which of the following five answer choices specifies, specifies all possible values of x? So there are five answer choices obviously we are given and our job is to locate the one that will encompass, that will incorporate, that will specify all possible values that x can assume. Let's take a look at it. It's very straightforward actually. x squared minus 2 is less than 0. If you were to add 2 to both sides, we'll find that x squared would have to be less than 2, which in turn implies that x would have to be less than square root of pa uh, square root of positive or negative 2 or rather square root of positive or negative 2 let's see how it looks like on a number line let's see how it looks like on a number line so here's our 0 here's our 1 negative 1 rather negative 2 positive 1 and positive 2 so here's our 1.5, let's say for example 1.5, where does this fall? Well, square root of 2, the square root of 2 we, uh, we know that it's approximately 1.4. Square root of 2 is approximately 1.4 because, because 14 squared, I hope you know your square, you have to know your square for the exam. 14 squared we all know is 196 and therefore the square of 1.4, the square of 1.4 is 1.96. And therefore, square root of 2, which is 1, which would be 2.00, is approximately 1.4. Anyway, square root of 2 is approximately 1.4. This is 1.5, which means it's got to be somewhere here. It's going to lie from in this region right here. And this is half. This is 1.5, negative 1.5. So this is 1.4, 1.4, right there, somewhere here. Right there is your negative square root of 2 and here is your positive square root of 2. It cannot be, it cannot be 1 and a half. It cannot be 1 and a half because 1 and a half squared, 1 and a half times 1 and a half, which is 1 and a half squared, we'll see it's more than 2. It's more than 2. We can see it very quickly here. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times half is half. Half times 1 is half. And half times half is a quarter which gives us two and a quarter and of course it will fall outside it the square that is the square of x, x squared would be two and a quarter if it were 1.5 it cannot be 1.5 and this thing that we just did I hope this is something also that was not necessary that you understood it that square of one and a half is two and a quarter because again I hope that you you know that 15 square is 225 of course we know that 15 square is 225 and therefore square of 1.5 has to be 2 and a quarter. Anyway, that's the solution. It has to lie between it has to lie between negative negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2. It cannot be a negative 1 and a half because if it were negative 1 and a half, if you were to square negative 1 and a half, if you were to square negative 1 and a half, it will become it will become Two and a quarter. X squared would come two and a quarter, and we know x squared to be less than two. X squared cannot be two and a quarter. We spend too much time on it. 
86 86 rather 86 says that we read we read at most now in the book it says question actually says not at most but it says exactly the word that is used in the in the book is the word that appears in the exam is exactly not at most I'm using at most we read and you'll see in a second why we read at most 50 pages per day and this is what they should have said this is what they should have said we read at most 50 pages per day they say exactly 50 pages and they go on to give us a condition a caveat because had they because had they said at most that gives the game away that actually makes it a little bit more easy they don't want to make it too easy the caveat the condition is that that we never we never start we never start a new book on the same day so we are reading a bunch of books we have borrowed some books from the library we have 28 days we have 28 days and the question is how many books are we going to read how many books are we going to be able to read in 28 days if we read at most 50 pages per day no more than 50 pages and the condition is that we never start a new book on the same day so if you're reading a book and the book only has 30 pages left in it and we wrote uh, 30 pages left from yesterday so we're going to read those 30 pages today the book is finished we're not going to start a new book today hence the use of the word at most but the book says exactly and then they go on so let's take a look at it enough, enough of the talk here so you understand the problem that we are reading a book we have 28 days to read the books we have borrowed some books we have borrowed actually dozen books from the library and here are the books numbers here are the books and here are the pages in the book one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and twelve 253 253 110 117 170 you know in my notes I have written two at a time I'm going to do that I have two of them written at a time and I'm going to stick with what I have in my notes 253 110 117 170 155 50 205 70 165 105 143 and 207 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 and 12 as you can see we have borrowed a dozen books from the library these are the number of pages in the book we can read 50 pages in a day if we finish a book we are not going to start a new book the question is in the 28 days that we have how many books can we read let's find out let's find out this problem this problem is not difficult it's a very straightforward problem you just have to pay attention it's just a matter of paying attention because if you get it wrong not because if you get it wrong the reason is not because it involves complicated mathematics is because you were not paying attention that's what it is pay attention so here we go let's pay attention okay how many days are we going to take to finish to finish the first book the very first one is a tricky one it's 253 253 pages we are reading we are reading at most we are reading at most 50 50 pages per day in five days we're going to read 250 pages Blast it! In five days we are going to read 250 pages. The book has 253 pages. It is going to take us six days. It is going to take us six days. And then we are going to read those remaining three pages on the sixth day. After having read just three pages, 
assuming that we read exactly 50 pages in the previous five days, on the sixth day, we're not going to start a new book. Because the condition is that once you finish one book, we don't start a new book on the same day. Therefore, by the same logic, the second book is going to take us three days. It's going to take us three days because we're going to read, assuming again that we read at the at most 50 pages there, first day, 50 pages the next day, we're going to still have 10 pages left over. It's going to take three days to read, three days to read, uh, second book. Same thing here, it's going to read, it's going to take three days. 170 will take four days. It couldn't take four days, you get the idea. 50 plus 50 plus 50 plus 20. Again, assuming that we are reading exactly 50 pages, we don't have to, but it will take four days. We never start a new book on the same day. You get the idea. Again, 155 will take us four days. Same reason as, not four, four days rather. Yes, four days. 50, 50, 50, and then five pages. I can't read what this is, number six. Oh, it is exactly 50. It is exactly 50, so it's going to take us one day. Let's find out how many days so so far we have. There's 12 days. 12 plus uh, 12 plus 8 is 20. So far, it's 20 days. Up to here, up to here is 20 days. We have eight more days to go. Uh, 205 is going to take us five days. Again, because of the extra five pages, this is going to take us two days. I think we are approaching it. This is 20. Seven, eight. Oh, there you go. Right there is the 28 days. Oh, what, what do you know? Right there is the 28 days. Looks like we're going to get up to book number 8. Looks like we're going to get up to book number 8. Even though we borrowed a dozen books, we're not going to be able to read the remaining 4 books. At the end of the 28 days, we return the books having read only 8 out of 12 books. Number 87. Number 87. I know it's a very simple word, but uh, not necessarily so, depending on your vocabulary and whether or not it is your native language, English language that is, caveat. We learned it on day number 63. Vocabulary, day, vocabulary, day 63. Not only you will learn that one, but you're going to learn some other good words to help you improve your vocabulary. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 63, along with my name, and the video will pop right up. Number 87. In 87, we are told that uh, we are selling bicycles. Bicycles sold in 1990 and 93. Here's the total. Total bicycle sold in both the years were the same. Same number of bicycles were sold. X bicycles were sold in 1990 and X bicycles were sold in 93. The difference is that the difference is that in 1990 of the X bicycles were sold, 42% were made domestically. 42% were made domestically, they were not imported. Whereas in 93, only a third, only 33% were made domestically. Two thirds of the bicycles sold in this country in 93 were imported. The question is very straightforward. The question is what is the decrease in the number of domestic Bicycles sold from 1990 to 1993. Well, it's a very straightforward. It's a very straightforward problem. The reason why it's a very straightforward problem. The reason why it's a very straightforward problem. It should say actually percentage decrease. Maybe I didn't write it properly. 87. Which of the following represents the decrease in annual number of bicycle produced and sold in the... Well, it doesn't say though. Anyway, the reason why it's a straightforward problem is because it's the same number. In, in both cases, it's the same number. So, in 1993, we went... In 1990, rather. In 1990, we went from 42% 
42% of x to 93, we went to 33% of x. And therefore, the decrease, the drop in the domestic bicycle was simply 9%, 9% of x. And there you go, that's your answer. We don't have to do anything at all here. The answer is very straightforward. It is simply 9% of x because we, we went from selling 42% of all the bicycles in the country that were made domestically to only 33%. So it's a drop of 9% of x because the number of bicycles sold in both, both years were the same. 88. Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight says k is a positive integer. Question is, what's the remainder? What's the remainder when k plus two times k cube minus one is divided by? Six. When k plus k plus two times k cube minus k is divided by six, and even if you do not have any clue at all as to how to go about it in the beginning, even if we have no clue how to go about this problem in the beginning. The fact that we are given this algebraic expression here and the fact that things can be factorized, we should start factorizing. Maybe we'll see something. Maybe we'll see something if we simplify this bloody thing. Okay, so let's begin. This cannot be simplified. It is just k plus 2. But this can be. As you can see, k cube and k, we can take out k common and we have k squared minus, minus 1. And k squared minus 1 can be further uh, broken down into k plus 1 and k minus 1. Which is simply a squared minus b squared. a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. I hope you know that. What can we do here? The next thing we should do is arrange them in order from least to the greatest. And maybe something will click. Let's arrange them in the order. This is k. This is k plus 1 but this is k minus 1. So k minus 1 is the smallest one. Then we'll have the k. Then we'll have the k plus 1, and then we'll have k plus 2. What do we notice? Given the fact that k is a positive integer, if you have a positive integer, let's say 5. If k is positive integer, let's just say 5. So this is 4, this should say k, not 1. This should say k, not 1. If k happens to be 5, say for example, this will be 4, 5, 6, 7. What do we notice? We notice that these are 4, consecutive integers. These are these are four consecutive integers. That's what we notice here. And the question is when we when we, when we divide this quantity, what's the remainder when we divide this quantity by six? Let's find out, shall we? Let's let's make up four consecutive integers. It doesn't matter what you make up, make up anything you like. For example, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. If you were to divide this quantity, if you were to divide this quantity by 6, what's going to be the remainder? The remainder is going to be 0. We already have 2 times 2 times 3 here. That's exactly 6. It goes evenly. There is no remainder. There is absolutely no remainder. It doesn't matter which four consecutive integers you pick, it will always be the case. For example, another one, let's pick another one. Let's say let's say 7, 8, 9. Oh, yeah, yeah. 7, 8, 9, and 10. If we were to divide that by 6, again, the remainder is going to be 0 because it's a multiple of 6. How do we know it's a multiple of 3? How do we know this, this quantity 7 times 8 times 9 times 10 is a multiple of 6? How do we know that? Because 8 is a multiple of 2 and 9 is a multiple of 3. And therefore, this product is multiple of 6. There's going to be no remainder. 4 and 3. And there we go. There is no remainder. The answer here is... What's the remainder when this quantity is divided by 6? The answer is, the remainder is 0. The remainder is 0. Number 89. Number 
What does number 89 say? Well, number 89 is the last one on the page, as a matter of fact. It says, it says, what's the fraction closest? I'm going to erase all of this thing. Closest. Ah. We are given a whole bunch of fractions, when I say whole bunch, precisely five, because there are five answer choices, and our job is to locate the one that comes closest to being half. Let's see what we have. We have A is 4 seventh, B is 5 ninth, C is 6 eleventh, D is 7.13 and E is 9.16 Now, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could be, you could be goody two-shoe and if you understand that expression, you could be a goody two-shoe, you could be a good boy, a good girl and sit there and do exactly what they tell us Find out exactly, divide 4 by 7 manually, five, 5 by 9 and so on and so forth. Or you can take some liberty and do this, do think, do this problem a little bit creatively. A little bit creatively. So instead of asking ourselves which one of these quantities comes closest to half, why don't we take that half, why don't we take that half and multiply it by 10? multiply it by 10 and simply ask ourselves which one of them comes closest to 5. Since we multiply this quantity by 10, this quantity that was given to us was half, since we multiply that by 10, all we have to do is multiply everything by 10. Multiply everything by 10. That's all it is. That's all it is. And that's what we have to figure out. Let's figure it out, shall we? Let's figure it out. And therefore I think that I think will take a less time then doing it out the fractions. So, 40 divided by 7, 40 has, 40 has 5 seven. 5 sevens are 35. After we take away 35 from the 40, we have a remainder of 5. So it looks like it's 5 and 5 seven. Let's do right here. 9, nine five are 45. 9 five are 45. After we take away 45 from the 9, or 45 from the 50, we have a remainder of 5. So it's 5 9. Five, nine. And since we're looking for one to come that closest to closest to five, as you can see, five nine is already closer to to four to five than five five seven is. Let's continue. Uh, again, if we divide it, sixty sixty has sixty has five elevens. Five elevens are fifty five, and we have five eleven. There we go. Five eleven is even closer than this guy. We want to get as close to five as possible. And therefore this fraction has to be as small as possible, which means B is not the answer, A is not the answer. This, is, this guy is already closer to 5. Let's continue this thing. Uh, 13, 5 is 65. 65 and we have a remainder of 5. Oh, what do you know? There you go. That guy is gone. 5 13 is even closer. 5 13 is even closer. Let's do the last one. Divided by 16. 16 5 is 80. 16 5 is uh, 80. And we have 10 sixteenth. 10 sixteenth is 5 and 5 eighth. Now 5 and 5 eighth is bigger than 5 and 5 thirteenth. So there we go. We had we had 5 seventh, 5 eighth, 5 ninth. Why do you suppose they don't have why do you suppose they don't have 5 tenth? Because that would be damn silly. Anybody can see that that's five and a half. They're not going to give us that simple. So they got 5 7, they got 5 8, but 5 8 is incognito. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like 5, this guy, when you look at it, it doesn't look like it. It's incognito, but it appears at 10 16th. So we got 5 7, 5 8, 5 9. There is no 5 10, obviously 5 11, 5 13 is the smallest one. This guy comes closest to 5, and therefore the answer is D. Therefore the answer is D. Now, the reason I'm still here,
this is the end of the page and usually we stop here but the reason I'm still talking here and yapping away is because question number 90 even though it appears in the next page in the book it just I just happened to put that inadvertently in my notes on the same page as the one we're doing here so let's get get let's take care of 90 in case I forget it next time because it's not in it's on this page right here number 90 it says p is not equal to 0 and we are told that p minus 1 over p squared, 1 minus p squared over p equals r times p, r times p. And the question is very, very simple. The question simply is, how much is r? How much is r? All they want you to do, all they want you to do is solve this simple expression for, for r. So let's do that, shall we? Let's solve this expression for r. The very first thing we're going to do here is to multiply the entire thing by p. So multiply this, this term by p, multiply this term by p, and multiply this term by p. I'm, I'm, I'm being too childish. Just multiply the entire equation by p so that we can get rid of this p. And it becomes p squared minus 1 minus p squared. Don't open the parentheses yet. And there's your r. That's it. We're almost done. So p squared minus 1 plus p squared equals r. p squared and p squared is 2p squared minus 1 equals r. And there's your answer to number 90. In case I forget to do it next time when we do multiple choice questions. Because tomorrow when we meet, we'll do data sufficiency problems. Alright, we'll pick up from where we left off yesterday in the data sufficiency problems tomorrow. Alright, if you wish to get hold of me, you can reach me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Bye now.